the prophet spoke of the Messiah, saying, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. We sing together to begin this morning, number 395, the hymn of praise to Christ, our Lord and King divine, yielding your glory in your love's design, that in our darkened hearts your grace might shine. Hallelujah. Number 395. Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. O oh God, our Father, as we draw near together in your name this morning, how wonderful it is that we can approach you and seek your face and find fellowship in your presence, you who are our Creator, our Lord and King divine, the great God, the Father of an infinite majesty, perfect in power and might 
and majesty and glory. And yet we are frail creatures of the dust. And how should we presume to come near so marvelous and mighty a God? And yet, Lord, your word teaches us that you are a God who has condescended, come down to draw near to us, to seek out the love of our poor and fragile hearts, that you desire that we should be your friends, that we should be those who share in your everlasting life with you. How we marvel, how we wonder, how we rejoice in the sheer magnitude of your self-giving, that we might come in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, the only mediator between heaven and earth, the only mediator between eternity and time and between holiness and sinfulness. We should come in Jesus' name and through him, therefore, find the gates of heaven, the gates of your eternal kingdom thrown open to us. Lord, as we ponder these things, it is indeed darkness to our intellect, but sunshine to our hearts. And so we come, Lord, with hope, with joy, even with great confidence, assured as we are of our welcome into the Father's house through Jesus Christ, the beloved Son, because we have a wonderful, saving God, a God of grace and mercy that knows no bounds. And so, Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you shower upon us, greatest of all, the gift of forgiveness in Jesus Christ, your Son. We have deserved nothing save your anger, save utter estrangement from you. Yet what we have received is great mercy. And Lord, we know that we are people who need your mercy. We know we need it freely every day. And so we come this morning together asking that you forgive our sins afresh, that you renew within us and within our hearts the life that comes from you alone. We need your pardoning grace, and so we ask, Lord, that you would fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, that you would draw near to us to reveal yourself afresh to our eyes and to our hearts through this, your ever-living Word. May we know your Word, searching us, challenging us, trying us, but also strengthening us and equipping us and assuring us of your great love towards us and of your safekeeping around us and of your true leading of every step in this, the path of life, as you lead us in the way everlasting. Lord, we need you, and we know that you have promised to meet that need for everyone who comes asking, seeking, and knocking. And so we come this morning seeking, asking, knocking that the door might be opened to us in the precious name of Jesus, your Son. And so we know with confidence that you will hear us and that you will answer our prayer. For everything we ask is in the name of Jesus Christ, our blessed Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome indeed. Uh, as I've said to all of you this morning, if you're visiting here, if you're with us for the first time, then uh, 
a very particular welcome, and I hope we'll have a chance to greet you properly after the service. Those of you downstairs, I can't see you, but I hope that you can see and hear us, and uh, you are just as welcome uh, in the fellowship here. Let me draw your attention just briefly to these sheets that you have on your seats. Um, they have a number of notices for the, uh, for the week ahead, and I want to draw your attention particularly just to one or two things. At the bottom of the middle section, you'll see that this Wednesday evening is the first of two evenings we're having uh, when our various different small groups are meeting, all of them here, and uh, for this central summer teaching, there'll be three different uh, strands we'll meet together, and then three different uh, strands, each looking to help us in our everyday lives as we honor the Lord in everything, in uh, employment, all the matters to do with how we honor and serve the Lord uh, in our daily work, in evangelism, in our daily lives as we seek to bring the gospel to bear wherever we are with uh, our friends, with our neighbors, with family members, and so on. And then honoring the Lord in everyday ethics. Some of the difficult ethical decisions that we find ourselves having to think about in the church today and uh, where we find ourselves greatly at variance with the world. My goodness, this week isn't that uh, very plain and obvious before our eyes. These are difficult things and in all of these areas we're hoping to encourage one another and have opportunity to learn, to discuss and uh, to help one another. So do come along on Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock, and uh, we hope that that will be an encouraging time for us all. Then finally, at the bottom on the right-hand side, just as we mentioned last week, do please keep uh, the 10th of June firmly in your diaries for our annual update meeting. We have a chance to review the year, looking back, uh, to give thanks to God, also to uh, look forward at plans for the coming year and uh, to talk about various matters of uh, housekeeping together as a fellowship. So please uh, do make every effort to come. If you need a hand, if you need uh, someone to give you a lift, uh, or in, uh, in any other way to help you to be there, please let us know, and we'd be glad to try and help uh, wherever possible. Well, I'll let you read the rest of the, uh, uh, the notices here at your leisure. Uh, use them, as always, to help you in your prayers as we pray together as a fellowship throughout the week uh, for all that God is doing uh, in the midst of us. But we're going to turn now to our Bible reading. You'll find it in Luke's Gospel at chapter 16. If you have one of our church visitors' Bibles, that's page 875, I think, page 875, and we're reading at Luke chapter 16 and at verse 14. And we're reading through to chapter 17, verse 10, and you'll see that uh, this is the last of the four discourses of Jesus in this particular section of Luke's Gospel, where all the focus is on um, the perfection of of the coming kingdom that Jesus uh, is bringing. You'll see at chapter 7, verse 11, we have another one of those little marker posts that Luke has all the way through the gospel, telling us when we start a new section and reminding us that Jesus is on a journey and he's teaching his disciples uh, as he goes. And so this last section here points us once again, as he's been doing through all of these chapters, to the kingdom of God and its coming as a great celebration, as a banquet, as a feast uh, full of great comforts for the people of God, but not, alas, for everyone. So let's read at chapter 16, verse 14. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and that is what Jesus had just been saying about the impossibility of serving God and money or mammon, the things of this world, the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone is forcefully urged into it. I'm reading the footnote reading there, which I think is, is better. Since then, the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone is forcefully urged into it, to enter it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. 
there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs, unclean animals, came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, in hell, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And he said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he's come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what he was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. Amen. May God bless to us. This is word. We're going to sing now hymn number 810, a hymn that reminds us of the nature of the mind of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, which he demands must dwell richly in everyone who would likewise follow him as a disciple. Number 810, may the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day.
Well, as the musicians play now, we have some moments of quiet. You may like to read over again these words we'll be studying shortly, or perhaps just to be in quiet prayer. But as we do that, our offerings will be received. Let's pray together. Our gracious Father, we are glad to bring these offerings before you, to join them with all the giving of our fellowship. And we ask that you would take them and use them as they're given, as love offerings in response to your great grace and mercy to us. Your material blessings to us, Lord, also are great and bountiful, and we recognize the privilege that we share in living in this nation with all its wealth and abundance. We ask, Lord, that you would take and use these gifts, that they might be used for the building of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ in this land and in others, that men and women and boys and girls walking in darkness might see the great light and the great love which shines in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. How greatly our world needs the light of your glory, O God, the light of your truth, to lead it in the path of righteousness, in the path of health and of well-being and of peace. We see a world riven by wars and conflicts, by civil commotion and unrest, by terrorism, by the creeping fear of the dark shadow of uh, the Islamic State in the Middle East, by the increasing encroachment of terrorism upon different countries of that area, the responses, some proportionate, some it seems disproportionate, by the governing leaders of these lands. And understandably, O God, we fear, we fear for a world cut adrift from its moorings in the righteousness of your law, of your word, which is the instruction, the light of life, the way of goodness, the way of health. And yet man, in his arrogance, has closed this book and has walked his own way, thinking that we in the knowledge and the discoveries of our own hearts, should know better than you, the God who made us. 
Lord, we look at our own nation, once so greatly founded upon the rocks of civilization that came so greatly from the ways of your word. And yet now in these British Isles, it seems hardly a week goes by without another opportunity in which people delight to shake their fist at God Almighty in heaven as though he were deaf and dumb, as though he were impotent, as though we had power over you, O God Most High. As we think of the referendum in the south of Ireland in these last days, if we think of so many things that have happened in our own land of Great Britain, we fear, O God, for the future of a society and of a civilization so taken up in its own arrogance, its own self-regard. Lord, we pray for your church in these islands, shaken and in some senses rightly shaken to the core and having to come to terms with its increasing impotence and the increasing indifference of the world to any message that it might have. Surely this has come about, O oh God, because of the ineffectiveness and the foolishness of what has come so often in the name of the word of your church, in the name of the word of God. We need not be surprised that where the church increasingly abandons the rock and the anchor of truth, so the world will abandon the church, so its voice will not be heard. And so, Lord, we are conscious of our need as those who call themselves your people, as those who name the name of Christ, who claim to have a message to teach and to preach to this world. How we need to be humbled, O oh God Most High. How we need to look in our own hearts and pay attention to ourselves. That we might realize that you are a God who sees not the outside, but the innermost parts. You are the God who sees our hearts. And therefore, there is no hiding from you. If we desire, O oh God, a church in this land that is strong for the Lord Jesus, that proclaims fearlessly the gospel, that will not buckle under pressure of resistance and even persecution. How we need to humble ourselves and to receive afresh your word, which alone can strengthen, which alone can work in us hearts of true righteousness, radical in following our Lord Jesus Christ on the road to the cross, which alone is the road to glory. And so, Lord, we come to you ourselves this morning asking that you would hear us and honestly asking that you would give us the wisdom that we lack, the wisdom from above, the wisdom which purges our hearts of all evil, that cannot come to those who vacillate and are double-minded and want to serve both this world and the world to come. We need you, O oh God, to strip us bare for your word to search us and to try us. And where it finds that within us that harbors rebellion and darkness and resistance to your will to cut out from us all such attitudes, all such hardness, that once again we might be those who follow you in honesty and in holiness and in truth. So hear us, our gracious God and Father. Draw near to us and speak to our hearts, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue in prayer as we sing the hymn on the screens. Now in reverence and awe, we gather around your word. Amen. 